I'm gonna, I'm gonna get started. I'm just gonna do a little intro, Norman, and then we'll start asking you some questions. Okay. okay. All right. So this afternoon, we are thrilled to be joined joined by Norman Oler. Norman is a journalist, author, and filmmaker. His book, Blitzed Drugs in the Third Reich, focuses on the rampant drug use by Hitler and the Nazis during the Second World War. And we are looking forward to diving into this topic with Norman today. So Norman, um, thank you for joining us and welcome. Great. So um, before we actually get into talking about the book and Hitler and Nazis and meth and all that stuff that we're going to talk about, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you decided to write about this topic? Um, well, I'm a novelist, um, born and bred novelist, and I worked on, I published three novels uh, in Germany and when I first wanted to write a novel about Nazis and drugs, when I heard about the topic from a friend, and then when I did research, I decided to um, do it as a nonfiction book and actually tell the story as it supposedly happened. Well, and I mean, I could, from reading the book, which I will tell everybody who's listening, you guys should go and um, grab a copy of this book um, because I really enjoyed it. And it it reads like, I mean, it's unbelievable the stuff that happened, but it, you, the way you write, I mean, you're really telling a story, like you're giving this very vivid picture of what was going on with Hitler and the Nazis and mm. drugs and all of that. And I have to say, and I think Dan made this note in our Google document, like the um, cover of the book is perfect. It's like, it makes you dizzy looking at it. <laughs> and um, yeah, just a really fantastic book. So, um, when I was reading it, I noticed like you talked about this sort of drug culture of like the of Germany beginning like in the 1920s where, you know, like there was even was there drugs and chocolate and like everything. It was just kind of a commonplace thing. Drug use, it seemed like. Well, the Nazis prohibited all drug use, but the irony of the story is uh, in the mid-30s, uh, methadone developed by a German company and brand of anodine uh, under the name of Pervitine, mm -hmm. uh, not, not recognized as a drug yet, and becomes very popular very quickly, uh, as popular as maybe a cup of coffee is today. So after a short period of time, even uh, meth uh, chocolate uh, hit the market. Uh, so these chocolates are always a delight. So, um, I guess you could say that uh, drug abuse was rampant without people actually realizing that they were taking drugs. Yeah, so, because it was, it was just a regular part of the culture, right? Just something people did without, like, recognizing it as an addiction. Well, it took longer, I mean, just to understand that drugs are in a way of a social construct and prohibited drugs has to be, they're not you know, prohibited from the start. Um, society has to decide that these drugs should be prohibited and uh, with uh, methamphetamine, it wasn't the case in Germany, so it was uh, legit legitimately used to, to give you a little boost in your everyday life. Mm -hmm. And then, and it was it was something that was sold over the counter as just kind of like a like a pick me up, like just if you know you got a lot of stuff to do today, just you know just take some uh, take some meth or you know whatever you know whatever they branded it as. That was basically um, that was basically how it worked. It was quite cheap, and you could get it in any pharmacy. You didn't need a prescription from the doctor. Just walk yeah. in and, and get it. Yeah. And then, you know, something that kind of stuck out too in, in reading your book was that there was like this, the Nazis view of, or putting out there like to be pure and to have, you know, like to go against this idea of, of drug use and all of that. Like, did the Nazis just want, did they want to sort of be like the drug of the people that like everybody was just so into that, like this, 
awful like spirit of that party <laughs> the nazis were a very different kind of political movement and a new kind of political movement that uh, was uh, using um, techniques of intoxication in order to promote its, uh, its ideals so mm -hmm. um, um, mind-altering substances were not supposed to be part of that world because natural socialism itself was supposed to be the mind-altering uh, substance that was supposed to change everything. So in a way, the Nazis um, invented uh, the war on drugs. And then with the Power in 33, one of the first things they did was take all the drugs uh, that had been uh, legal before illegal. And then I, one of the things that that stuck out to me in in reading, you know, towards the beginning of your book, even um, when the Nazis were talking about what they considered the, I think it a quote from I forget who it was saying the like the Jewish infection was something they needed to like cure the world of and and putting things in terms like that, even making children's books that, you know, had, was in a theme of anti-Semitism. Like, can you talk a little bit about that idea too? Um, well, the, I mean, the racist ideology of national socialism is um, calling for a clean um, people's body, as they call it. They, they saw society as a, as, a, as a large body and that body should be cleaned of all strange elements um, should be cleaned of all toxins. Um, so the early anti-war, uh, not anti-war, anti-drug uh, propaganda uh, was tied in with um, anti-Semitic uh, propaganda, which Jews were also seen as a, as a toxin uh, in, that, um, in, that, in that body. Um, so the Nazis used the war on drugs in order to um, to oppress uh, a minority, in this case the, the, the Jews in Germany, um, which is actually something that you can see, that we also see later on in the war on drugs uh, by by other countries, including by the United States, using the war on drugs to uh, oppress uh, African Americans, for example. So it's. Uh, the war on drugs is being used as a tool to, um, to uh, um, um, exercise power, which is uh, power and control. And then kind of at the, the top of this whole Nazi party, whatever, there's, there's Hitler who is promoting himself as some kind, like he, like, you know, the talk of him as a vegetarian and somebody who, you know, keeps his body in top-notch condition maybe but yet i mean i learned a lot from your book about um i mean the injections his um personal physician who was i mean theo morale right like never really left his side it seemed like because he always needed some drugs um can you just go into that side of mm. of Hitler and that behind the scenes drug use that kind of fueled him. Well, this is in a way the second big hypocrisy that the, that the book uncovers uh, is the um, vast difference between Hitler's outer image as a teetotaler mm -hmm. and the inner reality of. Um, him being um, given um, over 80 different types of medication by Dr. Theo Morel. Uh, in, in the beginning, these were mostly vitamins, uh, but already they were given uh, in, in the form of injections. So Hitler, when he, when, when he starts seeing Morel in 1936, he starts getting daily injections of um, vitamins. Um, then later on, starting 41, 41, he gets the first, first opioid, uh, Dolanthine. And um, 43, he gets another opioid, Acodari, which is uh, similar to oxycodone. Um, 
So if you get your uh, injected into the vein, so it's a strong application and just in the pill, for example. So uh, he collects all the slides uh, downhill uh, with, together with Morel in regards to uh, the medicines and drugs that's being administered. And so these these kind of substances like oikodol, oxycodone, like these are these are addictive substances, right? So yeah, I mean certainly if you take that um, every other day, like Hitler did in forty four uh, with twenty milligrams um, injected intravenously, you will get physically dependent on it. I mean, and there was also. Um, didn't he use cocaine at one point too, but didn't want to become addicted to it? And I think was told like you you only get addicted to it if you snort it as a powder or something yeah, like that. Well, <laughs> after the bomb attack by Stauffenberg, the Operation Valkyrie, uh, in July 20, 1944, Hitler's eardrums were perforated and he was quite severely injured and had severe pain for several days and the new doctors, a, a throat, nose, and ear specialist uh, comes in and gives him cocaine, um, um, not powder cocaine, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to say this in English. He brushes uh, Hitler's uh, arm through. Yeah. Just put it in his mouth somehow, right? <laughs> and yeah. But this is a, this is a pure and potent cocaine, uh, and Hitler always felt the effect and was very happy and welcomed the doctor, saying uh, every day in the morning, saying, "Don't give me, but don't uh, examine me. Just give me that cocaine stuff, and then my head will be clear." And, um, a very important decision to make. I need a clear head, which is in a way kind of funny, but. You know, Obviously, also um, very serious, or at least uh, it's not, you know, it's not it is, these funny sentences or these funny occurrence uh, situations have been played a very serious uh, surroundings and a very serious framework. But actually, Hitler was high on coke for quite a bit from. Uh, July 1944 to October 1944. At the same time, he was getting, uh, he was mainlining oxycodone from his other doctor, Morel. So he was um, given a very intense uh, drug cocktail. Yeah. So there, so there was a lot going on with various doctors too, and there was, and so Morel was always kind of around Hitler, and then there was the other doctor who was like the ear, nose, and throat doctor with the cocaine, mm -hmm. who, yeah, because this is what happened. And, but there, then at one point, there was some concern that Morel was poisoning Hitler with some anti-gas tablets yeah. or something, um, too. Yeah, this is a very interesting chapter. It's, uh, actually, in the book, it's, it is a chapter. It's called <laughs> the, the Doctor's War. Um, there was a lot of suspicion against Morel, who was first a physician, because he, he gave Hitler daily injections, and no one knew what was in those injections. So there were rumors that he's a, an agent of a foreign power, or that he poisoned Hitler, or that he uh, at least could be dangerous uh, to Hitler. And when this new doctor, the cocaine guy, um, he came in, and um, um, I guess he wanted Morel's position. Um, <laughs> He was trying to to get rid of Morel by claiming that uh, anti-gas pills uh, that Morel apparently had given Hitler against flatulence or whatever, whatever Hitler had um, contained um, strychnine. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, you know what it Maybe. <laughs> this means. Which is uh, we are, it's also in rat poison, for example. So mm -hmm. the claim was that actually Hitler is in fact being poisoned. But then when they examined the, these anti-gas pills, they found out that the poison that they were not dangerous at all. It was a very little. Uh, uh, it, it, they, they were they were basically harmless. They should they should rather have examined the cocaine and the 
told them, but <laughs> those were those were legal prescription drugs at the time, just like oxycodone is now. So they were not uh, really um, those. Th they they were not being used in order to attack morale. And so when we when when we're talking about anti gas pills, are these like to deal with his uh, like the stomach issues he had, and like what got uh, uh, morale like so, or I guess kind of ingrained him in in Hitler's mind as being like this great doctor, or are we talking like something, some other type of gas pill? No, we're talking actually about the Hitler. Health part, which actually did get Morel's job because of his six Morel gave Hitler a probiotic, uh, which helped Hitler. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, he always tried to find things against the stomach problems uh, of Hitler. He also gave uh, very strong opioids against stomach problems, which I guess not the right medicine. And so during this time, like obviously Hitler is in injecting, I would say ingesting, but in like getting injections of all these kind of drugs, he's becoming reliant on, you know, chemicals, whatever. But then if we look at the the military and the Nazis and those people who are having to fight um, in this war, let's talk a little bit about the the drug use there. Um, because I think, you know, is was it was it essentially, was it pervitin or which is kind of like meth that was considered sort of an ideal drug for the military because it, yeah. it makes people stay awake, but not necessarily more like clever and mm -hmm. thinking. It just mm. like allows them to follow orders. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the German army examined um, methamphetamine before the war started and concluded mm -hmm. it uh, lessens your anxiety, it lessens fear, it reduces your fear level, it reduces your need to sleep. Um, it reduces your ability to think very complex, mm -hmm. uh, but it improves your ability to get your, the task that you're assigned to done. So um, all of these factors combined uh, make it a very interesting um, substance uh, for a common soldier, maybe not for a general who has to make very complex, who has to calculate very complex um, problems, but certainly for a common soldier who has to just kind of uh, function. Um, just kind of do what they're told and get, get, get work done. Yeah, so methamphetamine was being integrated into um, the troop. Uh, The medical supplies of the troops uh, in April 1940, just before France was attacked, and 35 million dosages of methamphetamine were being handed out to the German troops um, as they went into Belgium, um, Holland, Luxembourg, and then Yeah, and that's, uh, I think, I know you talked about this before, that's how they were able to to get through that invasion so quickly in, in the first place, is they, uh, they like like you said, they distributed 35 million uh, meth tablets and uh, part of the, the stimulant decree that you wrote about uh, in uh, April 1940, uh, they're, they had to take, take two of these tablets at a time for every 12 hours, and they just didn't sleep for... And uh, they could only do that if they wouldn't sleep uh, for these two nights. Uh, they were only able to achieve that uh, by using methamphetamine. I mean, just try to stay awake for one night and you will just be terribly tired the next day. But do it for three nights and three days and three nights. It's not possible without uh, taking um, a strong st stimulant uh, like methamphetamine. And so was this, like, did this happen, you know, obviously it would happen when they needed to invade or whatever, but was the, was the drug use kind of a longer term problem for these soldiers? Like, and, and I guess, you know, a question, long-term methamphetamine use, like what, 
what are the what are the side effects of that and what are the long term issues that come with this practice during the war? Um, well, there was uh, a high ranking German official, the German Secretary for Health, and he mm -hmm. said this must stop a whole group, whole part of German groups uh, will become addicted to methamphetamine, also a whole, a whole segment of the German civilian population will become addicted. So the first measurement he took was to make it a prescription drug in 1939 uh, in, in the fall, but this actually didn't curb uh, the consumption and the military responded, this doesn't concern us at all. We, we don't need prescriptions, we're the military, we just hand it out. And, we <laughs> it. and um, even when he put it under the Oakton Law in 1941, which made Ferguson illegal, um, the army chief still said this is a civilian law which doesn't count for us and we can see that it gives um, the troop as a whole an, an advantage over the enemy who doesn't have, uh, it's, it's not using a stimulant. Um, so if individuals will suffer from uh, health problems, this is, uh, we have to take that into account and uh, that's just what happens in a, when a war like this rings. Well, was there any, uh, I guess, research or any any sort of, uh, I guess, uh, information regarding like just how once these soldiers, uh, you know, got out of the military and and well, I, I guess I don't know if they continued to get the, get meth, but once once they're out, is there any sort of like measured impact that I mean, obviously it's going to have an impact as addiction is a significant issue, but is there any sort of uh, research that went into like how this affected them in you know their transition from being in the military to being civilian it hasn't been researched yet i have been contacted now by an american researcher from a californian um, university uh, who wants to do exactly that research uh, but it hasn't been done yet um, i only have um, accounts from individuals here and there saying that you know, friends telling me that their parents were still using it after the war and was given. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a, a, a mother of a friend who, who received a pervitin in the 60s when she was in school from her parents whenever she had a hard exam. So even in the 60s, it wasn't really, people didn't realize that it's something, didn't see it as something not good, but, but still were using it. And um, also maybe it could, maybe it's, Perhaps the side effects weren't as severe as the side effects from illegally produced crystal meth, because at least this methamphetamine was being produced by a German pharmaceutical company mm -hmm. um, in pill form. Um, it wasn't snorted uh, in, in higher doses. So I, I read uh, about side effects, but I didn't come across like a huge. Uh, numbers of, uh, of total uh, Ferguson burnout. I mean, but then people would just burn out, burn out in general because they were losing the war, they were dying. So I guess it's kind of all mixed, it's, it's all mixed in. The Ferguson side effects were never singled out because it was just the whole situation so catastrophic after the war. Well, I'd ha I'd have to imagine just the PTSD involved, and then uh, you know all the all the mental health uh, side effects. Because well, I mean, what meth does is you you get five times the amount of dopamine that like just a yeah. typical like prescribed uh, amphetamine release. You get five times as much, and it just literally fries uh, your your brain. So, and that's the only way uh, you know you can go about feeling much of anything is by by getting that hit. And so you use more and more, and then. Yeah. Then you get all that, all the, all the stuff that we, uh, of course, uh, know about the side effects mm. happening. And now something that I, I wanted to ask you too about just, you know, as they were trying to figure out like what, what kind of drugs to give the, the military or how to move forward with, I don't know, I guess, I don't know if they were looking for a miracle drug or something. I mean, there was... There was some like experimentation on on prisoners, right? In like the the concentration camps. I remember this. There, you told a story um, about the is it called the shoe walking unit, yeah. where they would like give 
drugs and people would would walk and see how long like <laughs> yeah i it was awful this is this is what they made it they made in the war uh, they constructed mini submarines um they had to be mm -hmm. operated for up to a week and um, they were they were being operated by one or two men so these, uh, they couldn't sleep uh, during that during that week so the navy was trying to find stronger mm -hmm. drugs and methamphetamine with combining methamphetamine with curvacine and uh, with uh, methamphetamine uh, with cocaine and with uh, oikodal and opioids um and then they tested different drug combinations mm -hmm. in the concentration camps in Sachsenhausen north of Berlin with a food walking unit it was a penalty unit and they had to a walk all night uh, on different drug combinations with uh, backpacks full of stones and then the next day this these experiments were going o over several days the, the, the ss um, was trying to evaluate which drugs were actually the best which was the wonder drug and uh, then they uh, made made decisions upon based on on these um torture uh, experiments Mm -hmm. made suggestions for the Navy what drugs to give their young, young sailors to, to really see how extreme, to what extremes uh, the German military would go in order to find drugs that could help them boost their war effort. And then, like, on top of that, that there was also some level of experimentation, too, with, like, was it mescaline that was given to people to just see if they, like to just make them talk like there was an another doctor who was involved in that um and would say like he had access to people's souls so they would just talk yeah, that, that was his goal to get access to the innermost secrets of a person by giving mm -hmm. that person a hallucinogenic drug without telling the person and they used mescaline so they gave um, inmates mescaline in coffee and just told them Talking and um, then after half an hour, the SS doctors in Vienna would say that uh, I don't know. He would kind of use his knowledge that they were now experiencing um, a psychedelic effect, which is an, uh, it can be you know it's, it's easy for for you to be manipulated if you are under the influence of a drug like that without knowing that you are. While the person talking to you knows that, and um, so these are very early um, beginnings of brainwashing techniques uh, that the Nazis kind of get the, the grandfathers off, and mm -hmm. it's actually the Americans when they liberated the Dachau concentration camp, they took these findings and expanded on them in their MK Ultra program uh, using LSD instead of mescaline. So there were kind of these trickling down effects of like them starting this and then other people, yeah. other countries, our country, like yeah. taking that and running with it. So. Well, America took a lot from the Nazis. They also imported uh, a lot of uh, scientists and Operation Paperclip, the American missile program in White Sands was basically done by German scientists. They were given a free pass after their Nazi pass. They were given exile in America. So America benefited a lot from um, the evil uh, scientists of Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. so. and, then, and then I know I know you've also talked about uh, just that the alcohol use uh, within within the the German army and 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 I know you didn't you didn't put you said you haven't put that in in your book uh, just because it it deserves its own book. Right. Mm -hmm. and Central Europe in general. So I don't really see it as a very specific Nazi substance, actually. Uh, but truth is that um, not, uh, concentration camp bars drank a lot. People uh, having to commit, um, 
horrible crimes obviously drank a lot. Uh, it's very understandable mm-hmm. in a way to, to ease off the tension and, the, and to drown the guilt and, and, and all of that. Um, I, I, I guess that's a, that's, a, that's a different topic that might deserve its own book. So do you do you have any like any plans for where you want to go next? Like, is this a, a topic that you want to explore more in your writing, or do you have plans for what your next book or project would be? Um, yeah, I, as I said, I started this book as a novel. So mm-hmm. uh, uh, one project that I certainly have is to write Blitz the novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> And it will be a very different experience from reading books, uh, the nonfiction books. But, um, uh, and then there's also another topic while I researched, uh, I, found, I, I was stumbling upon a person whose story I find very interesting, um, but I can't really speak about it yet because uh, I'm still working on figuring, figuring out myself as to what the next project is. Cool. Well, um, we're like, we're really happy that you came and talked to us about this particular project. Um, I mean, I already know from telling some friends and listeners of the show that we were talking to you, like, I know people have already bought your book because they're interested, interested in the topic. So, um, you know, we're really happy that you came on and, and talked with us today about this. And, um, if people want to kind of look you up on the internet, do you have a website or any social media places where people can find you? Everything is linked to the website. Also okay. Instagram, so that's, that's a good starting point. Great. So we will share that with everybody. And, um, you know, when you write another book sometime, come back and talk to us. Of course. Yeah. And, uh, I'd be happy to come back. And, and thank, you thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Dan will, Dan will like,